Okay, so hello everyone. So today I'm just gonna wrap up uh, the remaining sections of chapter 11. And um, basically the objectives are really to describe what stiffness means in the context of solving systems of differential equations numerically. And then the last section is really about uh, moving on from periodic end conditions, which is the setup for 11.2, so that they could, the idea from the book is sort of like to control, uh, to control the, to control for different sources of instability, and uh, potential sources of instability. So they decided to, uh, close off this boundary conditions issue first and uh, focus on something else. And this time we're trying to relax this, uh, this restriction and allow for more general boundary conditions, okay? So essentially that's the, what's, what, what we're gonna be doing uh, today. Um, the chapter on stiffness is a bit, um, how should I put it? It's not very clear what's go, it, a, lot of, a lot of it is descriptive and I think it's best to see it from, from the examples rather than going to the theory because the theory in the book is not as detailed. And even if it were detailed, it's going to take a while to convey. Um, so roughly, whenever you see the word stiffness, the idea is that um, you have differential equations where the time steps are dictated by stability rather than accuracy. And uh, the fact is that this, that stiffness is more of in a spectrum and it can arise in nonlinear problems. And at the end of the day, the main practical recommendation is to use an implicit, an implicit time-stepping method instead. Yeah. So that's the... Um, Sorry, there's there's a bit of an echo. Uh, Ron, I think there there's a bit of an echo. Yeah. Let's see. Yeah, that's it's it's not as bad, so it's fine. Um, yeah, so. I think practically the chapter is the the section is really just showing you that um this stiffness thing occurs even in problems outside of diffusion class problems. Let's see, ah, outside of uh diffusion class equations, that is the focus of the chapter. Um, and the main recommendation for for practice is to use an implicit time stepping method because these methods have a larger absolute stability region. So the sort of like the framework for eleven point four is that you have a system of nonlinear differential equations. And the idea is that if you want to use past results involving systems of linear differential equations, the idea is to linearize f. That's the that's the key. So linearize f around the exact around the solution, and afterwards you'll get something that is similar to a first order system of linear differential equations. The problem is that when you do the linearization, the matrix of first derivatives, or if if you wish, uh, if you wish, if we if we stay stick to the scalar case, this f here, yeah, you, you need the derivative of f uh the derivative of f with respect to u at some point and that derivative could depend on time and as a result the resulting system although lin looks linear it's not it looks linear it's um it, you don't have a constant coefficient uh type linear differential equation so the suggested solution is to freeze time at a particular instance and then analyze absolute stability in different uh, at different time points uh, at different time points which you choose which you've chosen to freeze time for something like that and uh, another practical recommendation from that section is that 
you have to be mindful about the magnitudes of the eigenvalues because if you have strikingly different ma magnitudes, then you have to you have to take into account not just the stability but the fact that there are multiple time scales, um, and you have to observe parts of the solution that are slow, slow to get to in some way. So that's the this is very similar to what you also encounter in chapter eight, I think, or chapter nine about Krylov or Krylov methods, where the 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 gap between these eigenvalues uh, matter a lot uh, in terms of the numerical uh, solutions. There, and again, practically, uh, we want to apply a numerical method that has a stability region that is unbounded, at least in the negative real direction. And you could see that from, from the pictures. You just go to that part okay. in section 11.3. So, oops. So in section 11.3, you'll have pictures like this. And these two pictures are probably the key, the most important ones. So for example, for Adams Moulton order two, it's the entire uh, part where you have negative real uh, eigenvalues. You could allow for, comp for imaginary components, but it covers the entire space here. So in, in that sense, those will be much more preferred uh, than others. So that's what you want to use at the end of the day. So that's roughly the practical and uh, I guess partly the, th the theory, but not as uh, as deep. Uh, yeah. So let me just illustrate with a couple of exercises. Um, one of the exercises about solving this uh, nonlinear differential equation and uh, here, if you want to show that this is an so exact solution, it's just a matter of taking the derivative and checking whether these two equi these two sides are equal. And then when you find the linearization about the solution, uh, the linearization is given by this expression that you see here. Okay, so you have um, you now have a linear differential equation with a constant coefficient which matches the setup from eleven point three. And the lone eigenvalue of the Jacobian here, which is minus 200, okay, it's minus 200, and the relevant time scale is 1 over 200. And if you want to know more about these uh, time scales, you have the definition or these, the, the discussion here where you have, if you have this or linear differential equation with a constant coefficient, the, the time scale is given by one divided by the absolute value of the eigenvalue. So here it's gonna be one over 200. So that's the that's the relevant uh, time scale. And then you're asked to use uh, Adams Bosfort, I think, uh, fourth order to solve this initial value problem and then compare it to the exact solution. So, so let me just uh, show this to you in Julia. Just make this larger. There. And so set up the OVP, the, the sorry, the IVP. So you have this ODE problem, and then the initial starting point, and then the um, the time from between zero to pi pi over two, and then these are the steps. Okay, eight hundred to one thousand two hundred, and then you go through a loop, and then you have to look at the errors, uh, depending on the total number of steps you wanted to take, and when you do the table you quickly realize that when you have um when you use 800 steps the error is at times 10 to the 52 proportional to 10 to the 52 
and then when it gets to 1000 it becomes 22 and then suddenly after 1000 you have this uh proportional to 10 to the minus 12. so this is a a particularly annoying problem um yeah and that's uh and here, when I compare to the exact solution, which is sine t, the method gets either no accurate digits or at least 11 uh, accurate digits. So I think that's uh, that's essentially the demonstration uh, for this part. Um, yeah. So that's problem two. Just before now, you move on, sorry, do you do questions? Sure, sure, please. Yeah. Um, does it matter how you specify the ODE problem? I haven't worked with these much before, um, but is there any like automatic differentiation that happens or is there a better way to specify a problem than another? Uh, that, that part I, I'm not very sure of. Uh, so if, so you have to look into AB4. So let me see. So there's no automatic differentiation that, but that's what I know. Uh, the, um, sorry. The implementation, if you take a look here for the imp implementation, uh, it's really just marching a solution iteratively. So there's really no automatic differentiation um, in this, um, in this situation, in the way you solve this uh, differential equation. Um, I don't know if I answered your question, but yeah. do, do you have... no, there, there isn't in this case. Um, yeah. yeah, I wonder if there are alternatives that do take advantage of that. No, so so here you have to do integration here, so that's why the the solution is sort of like you're accumulating. Uh, you're doing ui plus one, and it is equal to ui plus an adjustment, and so on. Mm -hmm. That's that's the idea. Yeah. I hope that okay. uh, clears yeah. things up. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks as well. Um, the problem four is, it, again, you're going through another calculation of the errors. And this is the nonlinear differential equation here. You're asked to solve this problem using a Rangakata uh, of fourth order, and then you're asked to plot the solution. And then again, you you do a linearization and find out sort of like the stability, um, the resulting stability. And um, afterwards, make a table of the errors at the final time, assuming that the exact solution is one. So the... Oh, so the first part is relatively easy. So you just have to use RK4. And let me just show you that in Julia. So set up the ODE problem accordingly and then use the built-in RK4 from FNC. Uh, you want 2,000 time steps. And if you plot uh, U, let's see. Ooh, yes. There, so this is the sort of like what the solution kind of looks like. So you, uh, it stays flat and then suddenly jumps to to one, and then one is the, uh, the solution, uh, the exact solution here. And clearly from this uh graph, you have uh you're gonna have pretty large errors, and here you're asked to explore what happens when you vary. Uh, the number of steps. So if you do that, you'll get something that looks like this. There. So at the final time, at the error at the final time, when you have steps less than less than 1,000 here, oh, sorry, around 200 to 200, 300, it's not even a number. And then gets very very small uh, after you increase the number of steps so essentially that's the the idea for for this part where you need to use a lot of steps before you reach a particular solution um yeah and the book 
asks you to find the one by one Jacobian of the system, and you can find that it's equal to actually the absolute value of minus one, sorry. So it should be equal to one. Uh, and use it with the stability figure for RK4. So in RK4, oops. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. mm. So in RK4, this is the absolute stability region for RK4. It's this uh, part where you see four. And the idea is to use uh, the extremes of this region to determine the absolute, sorry, to determine an upper bound for tau, which is the uh, the time step that you're gonna be using, okay? So here you have to do an approximation, but I used a minus three, and then you pretty much go through a similar calculation to get an upper bound. To be honest, I, I didn't really, um, when, when you look at the problem, it's not very clear where the time steps are showing up because what you're doing is you're looking at the number of steps rather than the rather than the uh, the increment that you're gonna be using as you march forward in time. So that's so in that sense, I, I didn't really I didn't really get the um the point of the problem except to just to, sh to show that it seems that if you have if you if you, the number of time step uh, the number of steps has to be large enough so that you'll be able to reach a solution oops sorry the trash is coming by to collect things yeah so um problem five is again i I think this is uh, roughly similar as well, and this is this problem is more to illustrate uh, the point about eigenvalues being very far apart from each other, and um, the idea is that you have this second order second order differential equation, and then you're supposed to convert it into a first order system, do a linearization, and if effectively the linearization will have a constant coefficient um, in front of it. And um, this is the sort of like the constant coefficient matrix. And then you're asked to do a solution. You find, find a solution using solve and then look at the resulting plot of the solutions. Okay. And then afterwards you're asked to look into the eigenvalues of this Jacobian. Okay. Yeah, eigenvalues of the Jacobian and uh, and then explain how the plot relates to the findings that you that you have in the in these two. Okay. So, so if you want to get the eigenvalues for for this Jacobian, you'll have to use a a, a a quadratic there there will be a quadratic equation here, and uh, it will depend on the size of mu. Yeah, and uh, let me just. So in terms of the Julia code, there's really nothing much new except that this time your function is uh is a system, so you have to account for that, and then you use solve again, but this time you're not using the built-in FNC methods, but you use the what is available in Julia directly, and then plot the solutions. There would be two solutions. One is for U and one is for V because you converted, you converted this uh, first order, uh, sorry, second order differential equation into a first order system. So there will be two 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 solutions, okay, two solution paths. So when you when you try it here in Julia, it takes a while, and then if you look at the plot, mm -hmm, there. So this is the plot of the, so the blue curve here is U of T, and then the red plot here, the red curve here is V of T. So the solutions become unbounded for, the solution becomes unbounded for U, but still remains bounded for, for V. And it's a very slight hint only, but here you could see that there's, 
uh, it's not a constant solution. So it starts somewhere and then goes down and then roughly becomes very, very flat, while the other one increases almost without bound. Okay. So that's what you what you get from uh, from the system. And then if you try to really look at the eigenvalues, okay, this pretty much uses the code that is available in the demo. And really it's it's going through, you encode the Jacobian and then find the eigenvalues of that uh, Jacobian as you go through uh, the solutions, uh, the solutions that were obtained earlier. Okay. And then plot what it what it kind of looks like. There. So this is the plot of the smallest, uh, sorry, the plot of the, the eigenvalues, or at least the real part of the eigenvalues, okay? And you want to look at their, the most negative of those eigenvalues. And the most negative of those eigenvalues almost reaches 10 to the fifth, minus 10 to the fifth. So that's, uh, that's quite a, quite a large uh, negative eigenvalue uh, showing up, okay? at least th their minimum. So you could, let me, let me show this to you, sorry. Yeah, see? So this is, these are the eigenvalues of the Jacobian evaluated at each, uh, each point in, at each point of T, uh, as you go through the solution that was obtained earlier, and you would notice that here for the real parts, okay, for the real parts, the 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 solution for you for you is growing, or these the eigenvalues are getting more and more negative, while those for for V. Okay, our their magnitude is, is still roughly controllable. Okay, as you proceed towards time. Okay, so you'll see this discrepancy in the magnitudes of the eigenvalues, and that kind of explains what uh what happens to what happens in this uh in this situation. Okay. So, yeah, I I think uh what I did here was not very satisfactory in the sense that. It's it's hard to it's hard to explain what's going on from a theoretical perspective. It's more of like in in cases where you have to do these numerical calculations, yeah, you, you, you really have to pay attention to those. Um, so in problem five, you have to pay attention to the eigenvalues of your Jacobian because they might uh, might drift too far apart. And that has implications for the stability of your solution. And then for problem four, uh, what, hap what happened here is that you might need more time steps to be able to uh, to be able to get to a solution that is good. And here we have the benefit of actually knowing the exact solution. But in uh, in the wild, this might be much more difficult. And then for problem two, uh, the, for problem two, you also have to be mindful of of the fact that uh, here it's you might come to a situation where your time steps again uh, need to be large enough so that you have good accuracy. But here you know, again you know the exact solution. Um, yeah, that's the. I think that's what I could, like, what I could take away from this whole, uh, from this whole exercise. In terms of new things in Julia, there's really not much that is new. Uh, perhaps the only new part is this minimum. I think this is not available in this in this section or in this chapter. But this is what you need if you want to find the smaller of the two, and then you want the real part and that's already available from before. Yeah. And then just 
one yep. question. Um, so these time steps, they're all defining like a step size as an even, like one over the number of steps. Um, do you ever work with like a dynamic step size where where something needs more stability, you use a smaller step size? I've had to do that in the past. Yeah, so the thing there is, a, I think there's a discussion in, in chapter six about those adaptive kind of methods. But here in this uh, chapter, there were there was no discussion about this adaptive uh, parts. Um, and even but these- that's, that's a solution to getting yeah. around the stability, right? Yeah, the, but it's uh, limited as well. Uh, I think there's something to that effect here. Even those multi-step or those adaptive kind of uh, approaches, you have to analyze their stability region and it becomes more complicated to study their stability regions. So in that sense, uh, there's a limit to, to that, um, uh, taking that perspective, but you can definitely try it. At least that's that's how I've never worked in, in this area. So if I base my conclusions or, or my recommendations on the chapter, uh, I would be a bit more careful about the adaptive ones because we simply don't know uh, what's going on there. And um, But here, at least if you stick to methods separately, and you try different methods uh, separately without that adaptation, you kind of have a, a sense of uh, what's going on. At least that's how how I would answer that. But again, I, I think I've used a non-robust sort of naive method of if it looks like it needs it, add, you know, halve the time points between and just keep doing that. And if it never converges, then it wasn't good. But no, yeah. I haven't actually analyzed the stability regions. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for that question. Again, again, I, I, it's the first time I've ever used this method. So I'm, uh, even I am a bit uh, like, uh, okay. At the end of the day, it seems like you have to choose an implicit uh, time stepping method. And, um, and, be, and everything that you've seen so far, at least from the exercises is that you're, um, you have to be mindful of all of those, the, the, the type of method that you're gonna use, the number of steps, um, and uh, pay attention to those eigenvalues from your linearization. But again, there you need to know the exact solution, or at least you have to have a starting point where you have some numerical solutions available and then uh, study it from there. It seems that it's unavoidable that if you're using it in the wild, you have to do, you have to carry out that um, that kind of a detailed, uh, how should I put it? post-mortem if you, if you wish. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it either fails or it doesn't. Uh, I had wrote all of this stuff during my PhD, but I had to do it in Fortran. I didn't have such nice, <laughs> like readily available methods. I had to write the range cutter stuff myself. Oh, I see. <laughs> ah, that must be, that must be tough. <laughs> now it's very, very convenient. Now uh, for 11.5, the idea is again to to include boundaries. So before we had periodic end conditions, so we didn't have to worry so much about it. And you have this same equation as before, a partial differential equation. And then now you have uh, boundary conditions. Um, the, the idea is to take off from section 11.2. Uh, you need to do some, you have to discretize over, over space as always. Uh, but this time you have to include the fact that you have boundaries. Um, so for that, the notation is that if, so the solution U at A, at the left, left end point, and then at the right end point B, uh, they have to be equal to zero, U zero in the notation, it's equal to U zero and U sub N. So, so when you're looking at the, at the boundary, at the boundaries A and B, you also have to take them into account in your uh, in your setup. And before we have the interior points, which are represented by V, okay? What you need to do is to augment them with U0 and U sub M. 
that's the that's the new thing here and the other thing is to think about these boundary conditions and convert them in terms of u0 and u sub m uh, taking into account that you need to take a derivative at some point so you have to take the derivative of u with respect to x evaluated at a and then the derivative of u with respect to x evaluated at b so that's why you have a u0 prime here and a um prime okay so how do we do the the implementation uh for this u sub zero and u sub m are unknown so basically you don't know what these values are so you have to recover them along with the uh, with the interior points uh u sub one up to u sub m minus one for the solutions now uh, the, the solution evaluated at the interior points. And then you also have to take into account that you took a derivative. So you have to replace these with finite differences at some point. So that's the that's the idea. Okay. So so here's um, here are a couple of uh, examples, okay. So I'll I'll use an I'll use an example uh, from problem seven of section 11.5. Um, the idea is to accommodate homogeneous Neumann boundary conditions. And the claim is that you only need to solve a linear system here. And homogeneous Neumann boundary conditions are of this form. Okay. U prime A is equal to zero. The derivative of, U, of, the, of the solution at uh of a solution at the endpoints are both equal to zero. And you all, what what you have to do here is to replace this derivative by finite differences. So for the left endpoint, you need to use the for, forward different forward finite difference, and then for the right endpoint, you need the backward one. So these coefficients that you see here, minus three halves, two minus one half, and similarly one half minus two and three halves come from the tables for finite differences, and then. Because you're looking at u prime a equals zero, you look at um, points to the right of a. So you have the unknown u sub zero, u sub one, and u sub two. Similarly, for u prime b, you have u sub m minus two, u sub m minus one, and u sub m. So now you have to solve this uh, system of equations involving u sub zero, u sub m, and then the u one, u two, u m minus two, and u m minus one are really part of this v here. Okay. So the idea, the idea is to set up this matrix in such a way that it kind of looks like the following. Oops. Yeah. So in one of the examples, the idea is that you want to solve these u sub zero, u sub m in terms of the v. So because you know how to solve this v part finding this u sub zero u sub m could be done in terms of the v so so this is basically how i implement how modify how to modify the code uh so that you allow for this uh homogeneous neumann con uh, boundary conditions okay so and you could write this as a system of linear equations involving u sub zero and u sub m and then express it in terms of v and that's essentially the the only thing that you have to modify. So again, you do a discretization. And once you do the discretization, uh, you allow for those boundary conditions. Okay, convert them into uh, into you in, into into a system that involves u sub zero and u sub m, and then and then carry out your your numerical solution. Okay, but for homogeneous Neumann boundary conditions, it's a uh, it's only a linear system. And here, this is basically inverting, inverting, and then multiplying by this part here. Okay. So that's the only thing that is new. And then for uh there's like boundary conditions in problem six, the idea is to include this time instead of the derivative u prime a is equal to something is equal to zero or u prime b is equal to zero, this time you want the solution to pass through uh, a, a t alpha, okay? And then b t beta, okay? 
And here you don't even have to solve a system, so a system of uh, uh, equations because you could directly directly accommodate the fact that uat is actually u sub zero and then ubt is actually u sub m just like what we did here in the setup okay so you just again you discretize in space and then for the boundary for a it's called u sub zero and then for the boundary for at b u of b is really u sub m so there's no system of equations to to solve because they are determined uh, by your uh, boundary conditions anyway, okay? Because you, this will be given to you, okay? So whatever alpha is and whatever beta is, they would be u sub zero and u sub m respectively, okay? And then every all the code remains the same. Okay? And uh, I'll just also give a couple more examples uh, or at least point to a couple of more examples. So if you, so this is basically what I just mentioned earlier, that if you, if those boundary conditions have first derivatives, then if you're at the left end point, you look at forward finite differences. If you look at the right end point, you look at backward finite differences. And then you have, um, in one of, in the Black-Scholes example, something similar to what you've seen earlier, okay? you want u sub x uh, at the boundary is equal to one. So you have to have this kind of equation here and then write a system of equations to solve for u sub zero and u sub m, okay? And then there's another exercise in problem one of this exercise where this is very similar to what I did, did earlier, but this is a non-homogeneous Neumann boundary condition because this is equal to one. So in the setup, you have to you have to just make that adjustment. And uh again, it's really writing down the expressions that involve u sub zero and u sub m. Okay. And uh the the book is not very explicit about it, but if you look at the demos, you have to try to figure out what their initial and boundary conditions are from the code. They don't say it explicitly. So it might be useful to, to write it down so that you, you have some practice if you, if you want to do this. Now there are, there are other uh, exercises that are available that really are about accounting for these boundary conditions. So it's really a matter of doing a setup and then using the built-in uh, built-in solver from FNC called Parabolic. And it accounts for the fact that you have those uh, boundary conditions okay, of whatever type. So you have to set up the phi, mate, the phi differential equation, you set up the initial conditions, you set up the boundaries, and then you apply Parabolic. And then there's a syntax that is available. So let me just show you. So the syntax is that you give me the phi function, the span for the axis, uh, the degree of this uh, Chebyshev differentiation. So I didn't go through the detail for that because it's sort of like just there. And then you have the boundaries and then the time span and then the initial, initial conditions. Okay. So here, uh, yeah. So, so let me look at the exercise again, sorry. Did I put the exercise here? Oh yes, it's here. So zero to five is the span for X. And then this is the uh, the M for the Chebyshev part. And then the boundary conditions G, G1, G2, okay. And you have to write it in such a way that, you know, you have U, U is equal to zero. U at zero is zero. So, so this is u is equal to zero. And then this is u minus u x minus five is equal to zero. That translates to u at five of t and then u sub x, derivative of u with respect to x at five and t is equal to five. 
Okay, so you have to convert this into an equation that's equal to zero, and then code the the bound the 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 resulting function. Okay, okay. So automatically, implicitly, this is g one equals zero, and then g two equals zero. Okay, and g one is for the initial one, and then g two is for the bound for the sorry, not the initial, but the left endpoint, and g two is for the right endpoint. That's the that's the coding style for this part. Okay, and uh yeah so i don't think i'll have time to really go through the solution for this one but let me just maybe show you what what a solution looks like at t is equal to one okay so it's gonna take a while Oof. yeah mm. yes okay there that's the the solution at time is equal to one. So the, there will be an animation that will show you the the behavior of this uh of this solution. You could create that animation as well. And then um there's an there's another problem where you're asked to solve an IVP. So this is the first time that I I solved the partial differential equation from scratch. And um you could um, look into the idea behind separation of variables. And this is the inspiration for uh, solving these diffusion PDEs um, where this discretization is done in space first and then after afterwards in time. So that's this is the inspiration, uh, this separation of variables idea. And the idea is that if you have a solution it will have a form where you could split it into two parts, one which is a function of x and the other is a function of t. And then from there, from that assumed form of the solution, your guess of this solution, uh, you quickly come to a point where you'll have this equation that you see here, okay? You have g prime t divided by g squared is equal to f. But the only way these two sides of the equation will hold because this left side is a function of t, purely a function of t, and the right side is purely a function of x. The only way for this for this equation to, to hold is when both sides are equal to the same constant that doesn't depend on t and x. That's the idea. And if you build off from that, you quickly be able to solve for g of t, and then you'll also be able to solve for f of x, and then you'll be able to write down this the solu a solution for for you and it has this form that you see here and you could this capital c here is an undetermined constant which you could determine using the initial condition and you'll get to the point where a solution kind of looks like this it's a solution that is uh of the form one over t okay so minus one over t minus one over a okay and as you can see as t approaches one over and this is the this is where the problem is coming from. Why is it it's why is it asking you to look at t going to one over a? And it's because of this. So as t approaches one over a from the bottom, okay, from below, uh, this solution explodes. That's the that's the idea. Okay. And yeah, so that's the that that's what they want you to take away from this problem but actually they want you to use this simpler problem to look into a, a harder problem where you have u square plus u sub xx okay and then you're asked to continue the demo okay continue a demo and uh see what happens to to the solution so let me just point out demo 11.5.6 demo 11.5.6 here this is similar the setup is similar as what you've seen analytically except for you don't have this u sub xx but this time you have this okay but you already know what the behavior is without this u sub xx okay and the time span here is from zero to 0 0.1. Okay, that's the time span. And you're asked to push this time span from zero to one, okay? And if you only look at zero to 0 
and look at the animation for the solution. It looks like it's well behaved to some extent, okay? But it it already gives you a sense that maybe things will become unbounded, okay? So um, let me, oops, oops, sorry. So let me just uh, put this down, okay? This time you just change the time span to zero, zero, 001, okay? And then I just changed the frames per second for the animation so that uh, you can see it much better. So let me just put that up, put that up. Ah, see, it already, yeah, has these errors, okay? And, but that doesn't uh, stop us from uh, looking at the solution. Okay, Julia, Julia, there. So it's a bit slow, but yeah. Uh, I'm hoping this, oops. Oh, sorry. Let me see. Should be uh this one is okay. Let me see. Mm -hmm. uh. mm. Just a moment. I think it's having a Oops. Oh, should be a bit longer, but mm. so here you already see that there's an oh, there are these errors. Mm -hmm. Maybe I should try something else here because later you'll be asked to change this four hundred to something else and see what happens there. Uh, let me just do that. So I changed this to two to two hundred. Let me see what happens. So this is for two hundred. Oh, right there. Okay, so that's for 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 the case where uh I changed this four hundred to two hundred. Okay, okay, and then you can try other values of of C. Uh, I didn't do a loop here to generate a lot of videos for uh different values of C, but there's um. There's a point where the solution is behaving very well, but then afterwards it's it's going the way that you've seen earlier for C equals 200. And let me just put 100. Okay. okay. C equals 200. So uh, this is T equals 100, see? So the it's going go, going to zero, yeah. But uh, for t equals for c equals uh, two hundred, uh, it already you know sort of like uh becomes un unbounded quite fast, okay. So somewhere in between is the critical value, and uh, again, this is very crude as I indicated here. So you could uh, there should be an el a more elegant way to produce all of these um. Uh, animations if you want to okay, yeah i have a question about that if you do have we seen how to um i don't know like so like in r i would do like paste to make that yeah um mp4 name have we seen the equivalent of something like that i i don't 
I think it should be possible to do because you have these pretty tables from before, right? Or yeah, yeah these pretty tables, you could add text to it. And for the latex string in the in the plots, if you remember before, uh, as you do the, the iteration. Curly brackets or something? Yeah, I can't something remember. to that effect. I think it should be possible to do. So you do a loop somewhere and then generate all of these MP4s uh, in pretty much the same way as you do paste in R, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Uh, the the other ones are really you know more or less pretty much the same thing uh where you do an implement when where you do the modification which i already did so here i have a modification called parabolic d and then parabolic oops parabolic hn and i think i made it i made those modifications available in the notes as well. So you, you have to change one line of the code to account for the fact that you are either solving an, a linear system or you don't even have to solve a linear system instead of solving a nonlinear system, which is which is what you see in the original parabolic co code in line 22, where you have to use a nonlinear solver. Yeah. So I think that's uh that's all I have for uh for this part about uh diffusion equations. Um I I don't know if it's really helpful to 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 the to the to the to the viewer, but uh yeah, in terms of Julia, there's really not much that is uh, that that is really new. Um most of it is really doing experimentation using the code that is available and then searching for a, a couple of new things for the problems, but that's about it. Yeah. Well, we appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. And you're yeah. done presenting now. Yeah, I'm done. Oh my God. Congrats. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there. I saw Sorry. most of it. I only missed the beginning and I will catch up with that on YouTube. Just had some, I'm using different equipment that I normally use.